Philosophers often speak using specialist terminology. Some terms they often use are possible and impossible, necessary and contingent. But what on earth do these things mean? As you'll see, there are many different things they could mean, and so you can think of this video as a guide to understanding the different ways these terms are used. You may have heard the term modality being used by philosophers. You can think of this as the study of possibilities and impossibilities, necessities and contingencies. What these terms mean I'll try to explain to you in this video. Here are some examples of modal statements. It's impossible for me to run from Oxford to New York in five minutes. It's necessary that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's contingent that I exist. And it's possible that I won the tennis tournament, Wimbledon, by beating Roger Federer in the final. All of these propositions express modal claims. To illuminate what these propositions are claiming, philosophers often talk about possible worlds, where a possible world is a complete way the world could be. A quick side note, often when philosophers use possible worlds, you'll see that they don't explicitly talk about the way a whole world could be, and instead just mention part of it. This is okay, they're just focusing their attention on part of the world for ease, but they could extend it to talk about the whole world if they wanted to, so don't worry too much about this. There's lots more to say about possible worlds, as they raise lots of very interesting questions, such as what we should think they are, but I'll save these gems for another time. It's really important for you to know that there are many different types or kinds of modal statements, and the ones I've already given are examples of this. This means that we can say that something is possible given a certain type of possibility, but impossible given another type. Let me give you an example of this. Logical possibilities, which are sometimes called narrow logical possibilities, are built on facts about entailing contradictions, with the root thought behind them being that contradictions can't be true. This means that something is logically impossible if it entails a contradiction, and something is logically possible if it doesn't. So for example, the claim that there exists a black swan and doesn't exist a black swan at the same time is impossible, since it's a logical contradiction of P and not P. By contrast, that the prime minister is a prime number is not a contradiction, and so it's not logically impossible. That might seem strange, but remember different possibilities will have different rules, and the rules for this type of possibility don't rule this out. So whilst a prime minister is a prime number might not be logically impossible, many people think it's metaphysically impossible, with this type of possibility being called metaphysical possibility, or broadly logical possibility. This type of possibility has more rules than logical possibility, and so we'll rule out more things being possible. What are metaphysical possibilities then? It's actually pretty difficult to say, and so it's often taken to be primitive. People therefore often think of it as telling us how things could have been, or how God might have made things, or ways it's possible for things to be. Another thing that sometimes philosophers focus on to understand this type of possibility is the identity of an object, what that object is. On this type of possibility, it's clear that it's impossible for the Prime Minister to be a prime number, because a Prime Minister just is not the right type of thing to be a prime number. There are still other types of possibility. Another one is often called nomological or physical or natural possibility. This adds even more rules. This time it says that something's possible only if it's allowed by the laws of nature we find in our world, and impossible if it isn't. So assuming the laws of physics make it the case that it's impossible for me to travel from where I am in Oxford to New York in five minutes, we can say that it's nomologically impossible. By contrast, many people want to say it's metaphysically possible that this could happen. That is, the world could have had different laws of nature, which meant I was able to do this. And so while it's nomologically impossible, it doesn't seem metaphysically impossible. Another useful type of possibility to be aware of is epistemic possibility. This means that something's possible for all we know. 
So for example, for all we know, certain mathematical claims could be true, but equally they could be false. By contrast, suppose I know for certain that it's sunny in London. As a result of this, it's not epistemically possible for me to think that it's not sunny in London, since I know that it is. There are even further types of possibility as well, such as conceptual possibility, which means a concept is possible if it has no internal contradiction or incoherencies. Moral possibilities, where something is possible if it's compatible with the rules of morality. Psychological impossibilities, for instance, it might be impossible for you to eat a worm given your aversion to them, and so on. For the rest of this video, I'm going to focus on three main types of possibility you'll come across in metaphysics. Logical, metaphysical, and nomological. For each of these different kinds of possibility, we can ask whether something is impossible or possible, necessary or contingent. How then do these kinds of possibilities relate to possible worlds? Possible worlds are used to help us illustrate whether something is possible or impossible, necessary or contingent, and we can also use them to illustrate these different types of possibilities. Here I'm going to illustrate a possible world by a picture of Earth, and so each picture of Earth will represent a different possible world. But remember, this is an illustration only, since there are possible worlds in which there is no Earth at all. If you find the picture of a world confusing, then you can substitute them in your mind for something else, perhaps a book where each book will contain in them the complete way that the world would be. But remember, these will also just be illustrations of possible worlds as well. OK, so suppose I think about those possible worlds having to conform to the rules of logical possibilities. When I apply these rules, I can work out if something is possible, impossible, necessary or contingent by looking at the worlds. Let's start off simply and think about propositions where we'll think of a proposition as the content expressed by a sentence which can be true or false. So what we want to know is, in terms of possible worlds, what is it for a proposition to be possible, impossible, necessary or contingent? If we look at the possible worlds and see that the proposition is true in at least one of the worlds, then we can say that it's possible. But if we can't find any world where it's true, we'll say it's impossible. Remember, this is because when we think about possible worlds, we're surveying all the possible worlds, not just some of them. Unfortunately, I can't illustrate them all. Suppose we now ask if the proposition is necessary. If it is, then this means it will be true in every possible world. But if it's only true in some possible worlds, that is, not all of them, then this tells us that it's contingently true. We started with logical possibility, but the same procedure goes for other types of possibility. If it's true in at least one possible world, it's possible. In none, it's impossible. If it's true in all possible worlds, it's necessary. But just in some, then it's contingent. We could also add in our more restricted possibilities by looking at a subset of the logically possible worlds. So for instance, let's think about metaphysical possibilities. These are just a group of the logically possible worlds. That is, there's nothing metaphysically possible which isn't also logically possible, although there are plenty of logical possibilities that aren't metaphysical ones. Again, once we apply the rules of metaphysical possibility, we can say that a proposition is metaphysically possible if it's true in at least one possible world, and impossible if it's true in none of them. And a proposition is necessarily true in a metaphysical sense if it's true in all possible worlds, and contingent if it's just true in some of them. I'm not going to run through the process again, but exactly the same could be said for nomological possibilities. Again, these will just be a subset of the metaphysically possible worlds, that is, in all worlds where our laws of nature hold, but I take it that you get the idea. Before I turn to the final thing which is important for you to know, let me just say this. You might be asking yourself, You've talked of looking or surveying all possible worlds, but how do we do that? That is, what's the epistemology of modality? You could also be thinking, what's the connection between being necessary and true in all possible worlds? These are all interesting and good questions, but I'm afraid that thinking about them more will have to wait for another time. The last thing I'm going to talk about here is the distinction between de dicto and de re modality. 
It's been there in the background, but now it's time to make it explicit. Dedicto modality is the type of modality that applies to propositions, which is the one I used a minute ago to illustrate how possible worlds work. By contrast, de re modality applies not to propositions, but instead to things like objects or entities. Well, what I've just said actually isn't quite right, since there are de re modal truths about propositions, such as this proposition is necessarily a proposition. But for our purposes, to make things easier, let's think about de re modality applying to objects and entities and de dicto modality applying to propositions. The distinction between de re and de dicto is important because as we'll see, something being necessary in a de re sense is different from it being necessary in a de dicto sense. Let me explain. Remember that for de dicto modality, something is necessary if it's true in all possible worlds. This isn't the case for de re modality. For example, lots of people claim that it's necessary that if I exist, I'm necessarily a human being. In this example, there's a necessity that attaches to me. But this doesn't mean that I exist in all possible worlds. Rather, what it means is that in all possible worlds in which I exist, I'm necessarily a human being. I couldn't be anything else. With this, we can see how possible worlds will illustrate de re modality. For ease, let's imagine a case where we're asking if it's possible that I had blonde hair. If this is possible, in a de re sense, then there'll be some possible worlds where I exist and have blonde hair. And if it's impossible, there'll be no possible worlds where I exist and have blonde hair. If my having blonde hair is necessary in a de re sense, then this means that in all possible worlds where I exist, I will have blonde hair. But if it's contingent, then it just means that I'll only have blonde hair in some of the possible worlds that I exist in. What de re modality is supposed to help us see is the essential nature of an object. In a future video, I'll talk more about what people mean by essence, as this is something people disagree about. For now, note that a proposition can express something that is necessary in a de re sense, but not necessary and instead contingent in a de dicto sense. So for example, that Ali has blonde hair might be necessary in a de re sense, Ali has blonde hair necessarily, but contingent in a de dicto sense. That is, it's false that necessarily Ali has blonde hair. The reason for this is that in the de re sense, the necessity attaches to Ali alone, whereas in the de dicto sense, it attaches to Ali has blonde hair, which means that if it's true, then Ali must exist in all possible worlds, and as much as he might want to, he doesn't. The key thing then, to work out whether the type of modal statement you're dealing with is de dicto or de re, is whether it attaches to the proposition as a whole, or an object or entity within the proposition. If it attaches to the whole proposition, it's de dicto, and if it's just to the object within it, then it's de re. This might all be a little confusing, so you might have to watch this video again. But that's okay, philosophy is often confusing. In any case, I hope this video will give you a flavour of what philosophers mean when they speak about modality and modal statements. In future videos, I'll tell you more about possible worlds and how different philosophers think about them. So remember to subscribe if you'd like to learn more about that, and give this video a like if you found it helpful.